So our second speaker is Karen Potter from the University of Liverpool. Okay, well, thank you for inviting me, Sean. I did actually think the email invitation was spam, actually. Your fabulous talk, dot, 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 delete. <laughs> but, yeah, feeling a little bit of a fish out of water, something completely different. Um, but chatting to people last night, feeling a little bit more reassured that I'll strike a chord, as Paul did think. But if I don't, blame Paul. <laughs> OK, so overview of the presentation. I'm just looking at this contested space, the floodplain. I come from a planning perspective, I'm an ex-planning practitioner, now I've returned to university. Um, I'm looking at natural approaches to flood risk management. And then social science light, the light bit is for myself, not for you, because I'm actually a biologist by background, environmental manager. So it's, it's making sense of a situation, which I hope you know, strikes the chords. So, you know, going back to Sean's presentation, this, this familiar context that you know about, um, this, this Land Drainage Act 1930s, you can go right back to Roman times in terms of altering and modifying the rivers, um, but from the 1930 Drainage Act, you know, just rivers as drains from source to sea, get the water out as fast as you can, and then for me, particularly pertinent, is 1953, the Great Storm, which then unleashed this uh, flood defence strategy, which we copied from Mississippi in the US. And as you can see, just after World War II, this type of language, I'm interested in what's called discourse, and it's a you know, war language. We're going to fight, we're going to repair. I can't do a Churchill accent, but it'd be perfect for that. So, yeah, this flood defence strategy is just ripped across the UK, as in common with other countries perhaps culminating in the 1980s with the, the Thames Barrage there. So I, I'm interested in an urban context, being the planner, and rivers consider nuisance. So going back to Victorian times, treated as sewers when we invented the toilet, the outbreaks of cholera, so we'll bury those rivers, put them in a pipe. Now we've started burying them, or perhaps we can build on them and bury some more. And then just, you know, the ultimate demise of the river actually becoming incorporated in the sewage system. And then, of course, we've buried the rivers, we've drained these lovely flat floodplains, so let's build on them. Planners. So, going back to 1998, just how these floodplains allure today's developers, looking at these lush, empty fields, close to the middle of towns as ideal new housing estates. And, of course, this is what we've then seen is this loss, this recognition now, of the loss of the ecological integrity of rivers, which I know you're very interested in in terms of the habitat enhancement. So the loss of ecology, including the fish populations. But from my perspective <coughs> as well, it's, it's this, the modifications actually having adverse effects on flood risk as well, which, you know, that's what we're doing it for. And it's actually, as you can see from the graphic there, my Mickey Mouse graphic, that the flood defence is can actually pass the flood risk downstream or upstream where there aren't defences or perhaps breaching defences in a storm surge. So, coming now into the turn of the century, and we've had all this, you know, the sustainability building up, the Brundtland Commission in the 1980s, Rio, the environment, um, moving on to this change in the way that we're viewing this. And this move now from flood defence to flood risk management. It's a much more of a holistic approach, working together, working in partnership, the sustainable urban drainage, creation of wetlands and washlands to actually manage flood risk. And for myself, being really interested in the urban context, your daylighting, your deculverting, or your urban blue turquoise belts, so making space for the river moving through towns. So, as in the drought in the town. So similar objectives. So as I say, I used to work as a, a planning practitioner at Cheshire County Council. And this was the situation in 2004, we're looking to regenerate Northwich, which there was an infamous quote in the newspapers that Northwich over the decades had turned its arse to the, ta to the river. And now we're looking to, to re-embrace that through the, the redevelopment. So as you can see, you know, commanding premium prices for these properties. But in typical planning fashion, master planning done first, and then the strategic flood risk assessment. So Northwich is at the confluence of three rivers, and historically has suffered from flood risk. 
So with myself coming in, you know, this whole new approach coming out from DEFRA 2005, which is when I was there, absolutely perfect. I'm working as an environmental planner, all the partnerships, actually had the funding, public sector land, etc. So floodplain restoration, all this approach, absolutely perfect. I go making space for water, particularly interested in this, so that in times of flood risk that the river can reconnect with its floodplain, but during times of low flow, you've got that green space for people to use. Go okay, wildlife trusts. So it's like the wetlands absorbing water, like a big <coughs> sponge and just holding the water rather than rushing it off downstream. So as a planner, of course, you know, as well as your, your ecological objectives, is creating these places for people, this, you know, the enhanced landscape, etc. Um, the non-aquatic green spaces staying connected to the river. So, you know, it's come internationally as the discourse. This is the Dutch living with water. So we're going from this to this. But when I approached the partners involved, such so say um, engineers and the environment agency, we are wanting to stay with this. So it's at that point that I went back to university to look into this, feeling very frustrated as a planner not being able to actually translate policy into practice. And what really troubled me was that the, the obstacles were seen to be the difficulty in forming partnerships, finding the land, finding the money. And I knew that I had all of that in place when I was at Cheshire. But the one that wasn't tackled in the literature was mindset sort of seen as an obstacle. And what I was trying to work, you know, I'm a biologist, it was quite a rational approach to my PhD, but these engineers kept niggling me and thinking, <coughs> does that not take, you know, a lot of partnership work in? Does that not take a lot of money? Does that not take a lot of land? But time and time again, these projects are going ahead. We can do it if we want to do it. And it was that hallelujah moment when I read some research from some Dutch people. This theory, this social science theory called institutionalism. And what's it is in the gobbledygook social science? It's the way actors, you know, practitioners are working. They get locked in these patterns, these structures. So it's path dependent, just cannot break out. They've created the structure, but they cannot break out of it. So it's constrained behavior mechanisms of path dependency and then when you're faced with challenges so we've got increased urbanization we've got climate change these flood risk events become really you know challenged you cannot deal with these problems that are emerging so that's the social science but put it <coughs> another way that you might recognize some people have an unbelievable capacity to take any policy framework and adapt it to carry on doing exactly the same as been doing before. <laughs> I'm so, sure some of you recognise your colleagues. <laughs> so, you know, I just became intrigued with social sciences that, you know, it might just seem common sense, but there's these patterns going on everywhere across different policy domains, not just in policy, that begin to shed a light, you know, just give you that different angle to understand <coughs> something and come at it and help with the, the more rational, natural scientists to understand what's going on. So, just a, a simple diagram. This is institutionalism. It, it describes how we're locked in ways of working, but it also gives some explanatory power to look at how we can change. It's fascinating how some policy domains seem really entrenched, and then suddenly, you know, they've changed. Smoking in pubs for decades, and then suddenly, policies change. So what makes that happen? Why does it happen? So here's some sort of explanatory factors. So we've got our policy arrangement, looking at flood risk management, and then this political modernisation. It's a whole social science concept and shifts in governance that I've already explained. You know, this move towards sustainability, the move towards partnership, working together, more holistic thinking. So, you know, encapsulated in our approach here, integrated water resource management. Adjacent arrangements, well, I'm interested in planning. Really important to actually find that land and have a different way of working. 
But who are the policy entrepreneurs and what's going on with the shock events? So policy entrepreneurs, it's obviously, it's, it's you guys. It's the Wildlife Trust, it's the River Trust, etc. And I found that this is really drawn on disciplinary boundaries. So we've got Wildlife Trust here, it's always ecologists, geomorphologists, etc. Well, the odd physicists bearing in to break the theory, thanks, Jack. So Wildlife Trust talking in 2007, but we present this as if it's something new, something novel, we've woken up and we need to do things differently. But tracking back, going through the literature, here's Douglas, geographer, talking in 1976. So already we know about these problems. And he's already talking about floodplain restoration as well. So that could have been written today, exactly the same language. We're still trying to do this. And then Hay is a landscape architect. And couldn't this be in the, the headlines from 2014? That, you know, we're covering natural floodplains with buildings. We shouldn't be surprised if water then invades these houses. So, yeah, you tickled me as, a, <coughs> as an old trout here in looking across the backgrounds, just falling into that, what's called a discourse coalition. You've got that same background, same knowledge, same ideology. You're all talking you know, in the same position. So, 2004, storm clouds gathered over Boss Castle, and here's the first shock event that I want to talk about. Now this, talking about an assist from nature, was the very day before DEFRA were consulting on making space for water in London. And on that same platform, the DEFRA policymakers, National Trust, RSPB, you know, talking about the new policy. And of course, that was a window of opportunity, this shock event, debated in the media, took that policy through really strongly. So the policy's got a foothold now. Right, engineers. Now I'm talking traditional, old school, civil engineers. Not all engineers. Don't know, are there any in the room? Or can I just say what I want? One, okay. <laughs> Be slightly careful, but you're outnumbered. Yeah, I'm sure you'll recognise, you know, going back to 1976 with math, about land drainage being the first function of a river and a completely rational way for proper drainage from field to sea. But the Wildlife and Countryside, Countryside Act came in in 1981. But this interviewee saying, an engineer could have two minutes <laughs> silence on a riverbank and destroy absolutely every last living thing, providing they had that two minutes silence, I do regard, but then I killed them all. <laughs> and then, you know, the, this frustration that if you talk to flood defence engineers about capacity, then they'll talk about flows in terms of flood risk management. If you talk about flows, they talk about capacity. You just can't win. And this, as a, an interviewee for my own research, it's that lifetime of stopping flooding that colours engineers' attitudes, even where other actors are willing to innovate. So this is where, back to the, the gobbledygook, the social science, it's ideology and it's power. So can you share an ideology, a certain way of viewing the world, you've got a certain knowledge, I bet a lot of you have got ecology degrees, that type of disciplinary background. But you don't have the power, unfortunately. And it's, it's looking at who's got the ear of the media, how does society react? They want the defences, they want to feel defended. And take a look at a flood defence committee, just absolutely awash with engineers, holding the, the power over the resources and the decision making. So, as uh, Martin Heyer says, discourse contains structures that can be as effective in resisting political change as walls and barbed wires can be in preventing trespassing. It just constrains, it just structures knowledge as power and, and ideology. So, for myself, of Verity saying back in 2006 that we've only got this weak form of sustainable flood risk management and that is what I found, that the engineers' framing of the flooding issue has got that influence and dominance. It's really authoritative, it's institutionalised, and yet other concepts, understandings are discredited. Cheery PhD, I have. <laughs> <laughs> so moving on to planners, we get better. So widely acknowledged to find the land for change, but planners need educating in how the water sector plans and funding work. 
what policy to prevent development of floodplain is a joke. Development control is rubbish, getting better, but still rubbish. <laughs> and one of my favourite from a really frustrated engineer in North Wales, why don't spatial plans have contours as a flat earth? It's true. <laughs> so, but it wasn't always like this. So again, looking at my historical discourse, going back into the <coughs> media and the, the, the literature, the academic literature, Back in the 20s and the 30s, we actually laid out land, so using greenbelt as areas that might flood. So town planning at Oxford, preserving those open spaces, you know, the, the natural beauty of the countryside, but they're also the flood areas. But planners have just felt wave after wave of economic pressures. From 1960s, the population boom, planners have got to do more to innovate, so particularly in the 80s. Planners are a, a, a block, said to have been locking up jobs in filing cabinets overnight, got to refocus free and more creative play markets. We already know, Edmund Penny Rousel, that we've got to control that development, but nope, let's push on. And this is what we've got. This wave of development in the wrong place. So back in 2000, we're already debating this. We just keep moving on. 2007, so you can see how now these shock events are building and building. 2007, really in the media, really debating. Now remember, we've got the policy in place now from DEFRA, where the policy entrepreneurs have found that window of opportunity. Will we push through? <laughs> can we actually start restoring floodplains? It just felt on the cusp in 2008 that we were going to do it really got that window but then economic markets top trump nature 2008 and i cannot resist this the vast soggy blood plane of global finance <laughs> so the waters haven't received it we're into an economic recession shock event absolutely top trumping so we're back to those forces for stability again we were nearly there and then sounded scouts then didn't we <laughs> New Year. Back to stability. <coughs> so, next wave of pressures from Cameron, getting planners off our back. We're going to have red, red tape bonfires, got to boost the flagging economy. And we're delivering houses for hard working people. My favourite, <laughs> Eric. <laughs> Sorry. <yeah. coughs> and now, We've got 25 planning policy documents been reduced into one 50-page document. So really, presumption in favour of sustainable development, so-called. Proving wherever possible, and then, you know, Siren saying here, well, it's an easy read, whether it's adequate, it's entirely different. So, going back to this, this framework, here we have the flood risk, political modernisation, looking at planning, and we now know that the policy entrepreneurs are you guys, shock events, we've got the flood events, but in terms of the adjacent arrangements, to me, this adjacent arrangement has its own set of flood event, of shock events, and that has fed right through onto this arrangement and really solidified it. Does that make sense? So, yep. <coughs> So now what do we have? Going back to Northwich for me. Let's get the flood defence works. And then of course, 2014, get the wellies on again. I think you're going to be in trouble with the projects you've just shown. <laughs> Stretch of the rivers, green ideology turned a deluge into a flood. And on my rant, I've got another one coming out as well in more detail. And yeah, so what now? Do we need nature to now top Trump again? And will something like this perhaps push it through and get us back all the way? <laughs> so, you know, so what in terms of the social sciences? Does it add any explanatory power? Well, first of all, you know, planning in terms of putting planners in charge in terms of floodplain development, well, they've not got the power to stem for the floodplain loss, never mind floodplain restoration. 
And it's the policy making, the policy we've got, it's, it's this rational approach to policy making. It's just an idealistic distortion. We've got to look at this political and institutional context, which in this case really influenced by engineering and economic thought. But it's, it's to keep on going with your projects because as I told, it's path dependency, it's wearing in new patterns and new way of institutionalising ways of working. Although I do note that in this sector there's always this search for proof that it works. And I think this is really interesting from Frank Fisher, sociologist in the US, that you know, no amount of data, regardless of how well tested and verified it might be, will convince a person that anything important or useful has been presented if in his or her view the findings lead to policy judgments that take him or her in the wrong direction. So they're unwilling to travel. And in some cases, if you've got such a hard-nosed opinion, it can actually entrench your view, really harden their position. So what I feel, you know, looking at this traditional approach that we've got <coughs> in that nature's functioning to known rules and laws and we've got to understand this, measure it, control it, it's moving to what we call an adaptive approach. And in some ways I think, you know, this coming from Novotny and Al et al, that are a multidisciplinary bunch of engineers, landscape architects, planners, <coughs> still a little bit idealistic because I know, chatting last night, that the EA will be too scared to innovate. Um, but that, you know, in terms of a third sector, you've got more scope to experiment, to innovate. What's called a boundary organisation can move outside these structures. So, yes, we do need this culture change to innovate. We've got to accept small failures. But, you know, the experiments can yield great findings. That's one of my favourite books that all my students have to read. So, where next? It's, it's taking my knowledge now for my own PhD that, as you can see, I can just keep updating. I finished in 2012, but I can keep adding to this discourse. I'm um, working with the Ribble Rivers Trust. Thea Wingfield, I'm sure she'd love to hear from you. But it's developing a toolbox, but she hates me for it. It's taken the social science context into account as well as the natural side and understanding the motivations of the stakeholders. And we've just been successful with funding for a EPSRC, which is the Engineering Council. So I've somehow got my soft social science wishy-washy crap past them. And we have a, a PhD looking at the institutional resilience, so really looking at the social sciences and the stakeholders. So watch out for Elizabeth Hammett as well, who's joining Jack's team. So, yeah, did I strike a chord? I'm really interested in... I call myself a pracademic in that I'm not a proper academic, not a proper practitioner, but really looking at how to solve problems still in that practical field in the real world. Does it change the way you think? Does it strike a chord? I'd love to hear from you. And if it doesn't, as I say, Paul over there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.